Okay, so here we're looking at um, eukaryotic gene regulation. So when we start out as organisms, we start from a sperm and an egg. And together, this gives us our entire genome. Now the cool thing about um, this is that we start out as one cell, and yet as adults, we are made of 200, like, sorry, 200 different kinds of cells. And so how did we get from one cell to 200 different kinds if all of these cells have the exact same genome? So all of the cells in our bodies have the exact same DNA. However, they have different jobs, different proteins, different functions, different shapes, etc. So with this, when I talk about gene expression, when I say, oh, different genes are expressed, what I'm talking about here is when genes are turned on or expressed, that means that RNA polymerase can transcribe and make RNA and ultimately a protein. If I say a gene is not expressed or not transcribed or turned off, then RNA polymerase is unable to attach and there's no protein, no RNA being made. So when we look at our different kinds of cells, um, how we get so many different kinds with different functions is basically we turn on and turn on, <laughs> turn on and turn off different combinations of genes. So every cell has the exact same genome, but there's different subsets of genes expressed allowing cells to be unique and carry out their functions. So therefore, the differences in cell types are due to the expression of different genes by cells with the same genome. And we call this differential gene expression. So that's your box one. So now what regulates gene expression in eukaryotes? Like how do we know when to turn on or turn off our genes? So far, we've learned about transcription factors being required. If we don't have transcription factors, then we can't do gene expression. Um, but there's more. Um, transcription is a really common area and like an easy area to kind of control the amount of protein that's being made. But there's actually a whole lot of different steps involved in ultimately regulating the final protein product. We're going to focus mostly at the area of, of uh, chromosomes and transcription, but we'll touch on in class the end parts as well. So here we have some chromatin. Chromatin, you can see up here in the nucleus. Oops. Um, so here we have chromatin in our nucleus. Chromatin is made out of DNA wrapped around histone proteins. And so uh, we can either have our DNA be loosely condensed or tightly condensed. Um, so with this here, we have two kinds of chromatin. We have euchromatin and we have heterochromatin. So here euchromatin is, you can tell by looking at it, it's more loosely condensed. And then our heterochromatin is more tightly condensed. And with that, we want to think about, okay, if gene expression means transcribing genes and producing RNA and then ultimately a protein, we need RNA polymerase and transcription factors to be able to attach to the promoter sequence of the DNA. So if I look at euchromatin and heterochromatin, you can see it would be easier for RNA polymerase to attach to a promoter in euchromatin and much more difficult in heterochromatin. So generally, genes within heterochromatin are not expressed because it's so tightly condensed. Um, and so what we can do is we can modify the histone proteins and the DNA to influence whether or not it's euchromatin or heterochromatin. So when you want to write in box two the difference between euchromatin and heterochromatin. All right, so now when we look at uh, one option, um, here we have what's called histone acetylation. So this little blue circle represents RNA polymerase. And RNA polymerase is going to, in this case, be blocked from transcribing. If this is heterochromatin and it's so tightly condensed, then RNA polymerase cannot transcribe. So what can happen is they can add what we call acetyl groups to the proteins, to the histones. When the acetyl groups attach, it causes the chromatin to unwind and loosen. Now, RNA polymerase can attach to a promoter sequence and transcribe. 
So histone acetylation promotes or encourages gene expression by opening up that chromatin structure. Okay? However, when the acetyl groups come off, that DNA coils back up to heterochromatin blocking transcription and gene expression. So here's just showing the little acetyl groups attached to the histone proteins. So here if I have some chromatin and I add acetyl groups, go ahead and think in your head what it'll look like. Good, good. It's going to be loosely condensed. It's going to open up and encourage transcription. If I take off the acetyl groups, that's right, it'll go back to heterochromatin. That's called deacetylation. So now I like this picture because it shows when you have acetyl groups, gene transcription's turned on. When you remove or deacetylate, that's gene transcription turned off back in heterochromatin. So how are histone acetylation or deacetylation related to transcription? That's your box three. And now when we look at another way that we can influence chromatin, that's through DNA methylation. Now this one is different because we literally are adding chemical markers to the DNA and not the protein. And when we add methyl groups to our DNA, it causes it to become heterochromatin. And so now it's our DNA that is actually being methylated. So this right here is how, um, like A, T, C, and G, this is C, cytosine. You can see how there's a methyl group added. So it's an actual modification to our nucleotides. And it causes heterochromatin and turning off of gene expression. And so with this, what I find so incredibly fascinating, well, sorry, this is not the fascinating part, but so now DNA methylation is different from histone acetylation because histone acetylation opens up the uh, chromatin whereas methylation condenses and forms heterochromatin. The other difference, acetylation promotes transcription and gene expression, and DNA methylation um, like blocks transcription or turns off gene expression. Um, histone acetylation is a more temporary situation, whereas methylation is more permanent. Okay, and that's your box four. All right, so now the cool thing about methylation is that it actually can be inherited and passed on from parents to offspring. So what we're finding in science right now is that the life experiences of our ancestors, when you experience traumatic events, famine, starvation, air pollution, or even a healthy diet if you want positive examples, it methylates a genes in our way to are genes in a way that changes how they're expressed, and then those changes are passed on to our grandchildren. So when people say things like type 2 diabetes runs in my family, there's not a sequence. It's not A, T, C, and G coding for type 2 diabetes, but rather the way our genes are being expressed. So a person could inherit certain methylation or certain epigenetics on their DNA that increases their likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes. So anyway, we can talk about a whole lot more examples of this in class, um, but epigenetics is how these chemical changes um, are actually passed on to our offspring and our grandchildren and through the generations without actually changing the DNA sequence. It's not changing our genes, but yet how our genes are expressed. And that's epigenetics inheritance, and you can summarize that in your box number five. Okay. Now let's go ahead and talk about more specific how we regulate gene expression. So with this here, we have our specific trend, or I'm sorry, we have transcription factors that allow RNA polymerase to attach and transcribe and turn on our genes and make RNA that hopefully will lead to making a protein. However, we need a way to regulate this. So what we have here, when I see these two lines in this picture, um, so with this here, this part, that is really implying that there's a huge section not shown. So like all of this area is what was cut out by those two lines. And really when you see those two lines and graphs and stuff, it really just implies that like, hey, uh, this all won't fit on the same page. They make those lines. Anyway, so now here I have a promoter sequence. Then here's my gene that codes for a protein. Now, we have some control elements. P 
pieces in our DNA that are going to help to control gene expression. So right here we have what's called proximal control elements, or like nearby. And then we have distal control elements. These are kind of important ones we're going to talk a lot about. These distal control elements we also call the enhancer region. So when we go to turn on our genes, because every single cell in our body has the exact same DNA, but they have different enhancer regions and different transcription factors or very specific transcription factors called activators. So now these activators attach to the enhancer region. So for example, let's pretend this is the gene amylase, I think is how you spell it. So amylase is an enzyme in your saliva or your spit that breaks down carbohydrates. So in my like salivary glands that make my spit, I have the gene that codes for the protein amylase. So in these glands, in this area, I want to make sure I have specific transcription factors or activators that will help me turn on this gene. And now I'll produce the protein amylase in the salivary amylase glands. However, my liver doesn't make amylase. So therefore, in my liver, I still have this DNA because every cell in my body has the exact same genome. What I don't have in my liver are these specific transcription factors. So we can change the specific transcription factors in different cells to help regulate which genes are turned on and expressed and which ones aren't. So when we look at what happens here, when specific transcription factors attach, it actually causes the DNA to bend. This is called the DNA bending protein. And it'll bring these specific transcription factors called activators closer to that promoter sequence where here we have our general transcription factors. And now everything can come together and RNA polymerase can transcribe and turn on RNA like production, make RNA or gene expression. So now here we have our enhancer region and we have our specific activators that will then attach the enhancer region for a specific gene. Then we have our general transcription factors to kind of bring everything together. And then we have our RNA polymerase can now attach, transcribe our, our RNA, and we call this gene expression. So here is how we can turn on specific genes in some cells and not others. It really comes down to do we have the right activators to activate gene expression uh, and turn on transcription. All right, so that's the first part. I'll make a second video to go ahead and finish this off um, at another time.